let me guess how you approach your health. You wait for the symptoms to develop, and when things are bad, you rush to the doctor because that's what doctors are there for, right? Interesting, because usually for symptoms of cancer to develop, you need to have about a billion cancer cells already. You know to exercise and eat fruits and vegetables and don't smoke and take your vitamins and everything will be great, right? If that's true, then why do almost one in two people develop heart disease? If that's true, then why is it that one in two American men and one in three American women develop cancer? These are the number one and number two causes of death in the U.S. respectively. We need to ask, why isn't the standard of care catching this? Join Dr. Mark Lewandowski, MD, a 20-year oncologist, internist, and hematologist, with what you need to know today to prevent and catch cancer and heart disease early. So, I've been in school for a while. It's been ridiculously a long time, actually. And it's been an evolution. So I'm going to share with you the personal development and journey of about 23 years as to how we started, you know, practicing defensive medicine, being sort of traditional, boring a hematologist, oncologist, and internist, and sort of evolving into something different. And what started happening is, uh, as um, you, you heard, you know, I, I finished training at Cornell, and then my wife said, you know what, I've had enough of New York, I need something that's a little different, so let's go to Alaska. <laughs> so eventually we started running, uh, okay, can, you, can you, everyone hear? If not, just throw something gentle, you know? Um, so... We, uh, I started running a uh, multidisciplinary clinic in Alaska and started seeing this recurrent theme of patients who would come in with their urological diagnosis, prostate cancers, but they had a slew of other medical illnesses that were catching my attention. And because it's Alaska, primary care was somewhat sparse. And you kind of started taking care of these patients in a more holistic way. Um, and that was okay, because uh, reimbursements were fine, but then we moved to Colorado. And I was the head of uh, one of the cancer centers leading the GU program and, um, uh, and the breast program. And there was just a woman after woman, the vast majority would have sort of the same metabolic health signature. And I started like predicting what they were coming in with. And I said, you probably have this medical ailment and this issue, and you're probably taking that. And I'm like, how do you know? So we started talking about why they're developing what they're developing, what else are they at risk for, and how to mitigate that. And as a result, uh, I piloted a program uh, to, to patients with, with the cancer diagnosis and families, and that was a, was a smashing success. Everyone was happy except for the hospital because the productivity started going down. And what I started realizing is that there are lots of people who can push chemotherapy and radiation and other interventions, but very few, pay, very few physicians in my sort of sphere would actually talk to people as to why is this happening, what else are you at risk for, and if you survive this breast cancer, which you most likely will, what else are you going to succumb to and what else do we need to screen you for? So that's how the program started evolving and because of the pressures of the, well, you need to keep your productivity going, I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut the umbilical cord and actually focus on what my passion is. So I'm going to be talking to you about my evolution over 23 years and where I'm at right now. So before um, we do that, what I was noticing is that in addition to cancer, what else can we really screen for and what else can we aim to prevent because there are lots of common denominators in these patients in, in, in illnesses. So for sure it's cardiovascular disease. If, if we don't succumb to cancer, the vast majority will have some form of cardiovascular disease. Unless you think like my stoic uh, grandfather who passed away around 90, that you know I can eat, drink, do whatever I want and be merry and tomorrow I will die you want, right? Not do whatever you want and then you're gonna, you know, have immunity. That, that's not going to happen. So cardiovascular disease, if not cancer, but then lots of autoimmune diseases, um, Alzheimer's and dementia, blood pressure, diabetes, really things that we are succumbing to as a nation, as a, as a well-developed Western world. Uh, let's talk about the first subject, which is cancer, because to talk about cancer first, we need to know what it is, because there's lots of myth about it, and there's lots of 
misnomers. So this is a normal cell, and the job of a normal cell is to replicate and make daughter cells. So identical daughter cells, which further divide, and lo and behold, mistakes happen. Because we're human, it's our job to replicate, and it's inevitable often that we make mistakes. Our gut lining renews itself with a few billion cells. Uh, mistakes happen inevitably, and there is a built-in mechanism of hericary. You know, the, the cell is supposed to suicide. It's supposed to kill itself if there is damage. Now, um, what happens if the damage doesn't cause a death, if there is propagation? There are multiple steps, two, three, four, five, before cancer develops, and there are certain elements, there are certain chemicals, growth factors, insulin, what we expose to in the environment that helps to pave this process process of moving from one mistake to two mistakes, three mistakes, four mistakes. And what's important to know is that this is arrestable, meaning if someone's here, they don't have to inevitably progress, and sometimes they can actually reverse back. Um, and things that, things that put us at risk for this progression are genes, but we can't really modify how we've, been, what, how we've picked mom and dad, you know, it is what it is. But we can certainly affect catalysts that lead here. And this is a Western lifestyle. Um, how does this play out? Let's look at a classic model of colon cancer. So this is the inside of a colon. Imagine that, you know, stool is here and you have in a, another layer up here. So we typically recommend a colonoscopy to screen for, for colon cancer every 10 years because we think that it takes about 10 years to go from here to there. For an average person, it takes about 10 years to have that development. So step one, step two, step three. But it really depends on genes and exposure. So for some people, this process is going to be two to three years from here to there. For some people, it's going to be 30 plus years. It really depends where they live, how they eat, what genes they have, what else they're at risk for. So treating populations versus treating individuals is drastically different. You can't say, well, I'm going to subject everyone to the same strategy of, you know, I'm going to do colonoscopy every 10 years because you are going to be grossly over-diagnosing and over-procedurizing some people and grossly under-diagnosing and under-procedurizing others. So why, why, like, who cares ultimately, right? So I'm showing you lots of sort of scientific-y looking slides and who cares? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to you? And the reason why it matters is this. One in two men in the U.S. will have an invasive cancer in their lifetime. That's 50% of the U.S. population. It's a true epidemic. Women are more awesome, so it's one in three. You know, they're, they're more advanced, they're usually more well-connected, and other than the sobering statistic, and since there are more women, I can, I can speak with immunity, and I'm going to score some points as well here, right? <laughs> yes. Um, but what, what's, why one in two versus one in three? Typically, women are healthier. It's not that they're genetically superior human beings, although some might argue that, you know. Uh, but the relationship with lifestyle, with exposures, with how they relate is drastically different. And just that alone, not changing the genes any, changes the cancer rates from one and two to one and three. Gives you a sense that, huh, maybe it's not all in the genes. Maybe what we do and how and the choices we make affect cancer rates. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about really what we ought to do is detecting cancer and, and why old paradigms don't work and why the rates are what they are. So typically the way we screen for something is would, you know, would be equivalent to a dilapidating car, right? So say you don't want to do maintenance and you're just going to wait for your engine to start failing, making horrible noises, squeaking, and you, then you take them to the mechanic and you say, oh, you know, you've got, what, 75,000 miles, uh, you forgot to uh, change your oil since, since the dealers, and you need, to re you need to now replace the engine which is okay if you have a vehicle, but if that's your body, then you're, in, you know, you're not doing well. Um, but that's what we used to do. There was an apathy in the medical community as far as screening, right? So what we say, you know, you have symptoms, you come into your physician and they start looking for stuff. So how good are we when symptoms happen? So if someone has symptoms of cancer, um, 
it means that there is enough of a burden of cancer cells to cause the symptoms. And what's that burden? So typically cl clinical symptoms, so if this is no cancer and this is symptomatic amount of cancer, one needs to have about a billion cells for symptoms to hit. A billion cells for deadly cancers, like say lung cancer, prostate cancer, means that you have an overwhelmingly high chance of that cancer having spread. You're behind. If it's, if it's you know, early prostate cancer, then you typically are okay, unless you aren't. So we can certainly do better, and we can lower the threshold of detection to about half a million cells. That's about the limit where scans can, can uh, detect cancer. So 20-fold reduction, which is great. You know, we can certainly, uh, in the smart way, institute screening modalities and imaging and say, okay, we can detect cancer much earlier, um, but can we do better nowadays? And for sure we can. We have novel biomarkers and, um, and certain circulating tumor cells that, uh, that, that cancer secretes that we can detect when someone's at a few hundred cells. So we go from half a million to a few hundred cells. It's a total game changer. And that is really becoming the standard and will be the standard really within five to 10 years. It's just, it, it takes us as a medical community a while to catch on. And this is possible because we're entering the age of precision medicine. It sounds like a sexy term, what is precision medicine? You're like, what is that? And it's, um, it, it's really based off of the human genome track. But we have over a thousand tumor suppressor gene, uh, genes and we don't have to say, well, I'm only gonna look at this one or this one or that one. I'm gonna look at all of them. I'm gonna look at your genetic makeup in aggregate and see what the risk factors actually playing out to be. And I can do the same thing with cancer. I can do that with cardiovascular disease. I can do that with autoimmune disease. And I will have a really comprehensive portrait. Uh, how does this play out in cancer? So um, we've learned a lot about precision medicine and cancer. The way we treat cancer when it's more advanced right now is drastically different than how I treated cancer, say, even 10 years ago. So when someone comes into me with more advanced cancer, I basically look at what the cancer is addicted to. Is it sort of run-of-the-mill cancer? Does it have certain chemicals that it's really feeding on? And then can we target those pathways and poison that specific chemical with specific drugs? And when we do that, the outcomes of patients is drastically different. And uh, it's, it's, it's based on the concept that these cancers aren't static entities. They don't just sit there and stick your tongue at you. Uh, they shed their material, they shed their cells and tumor DNA into bloodstream. And we can exploit that for early detection and monitoring by detecting those snippets of tumor DNA in the bloodstream with very high accuracy. And the amazing thing is, it is much more germane to more aggressive cancers. So the higher the replication rate of this cancer, like a pancreatic cancer, the more it sheds, the more likely it is to be detected. If it's a low-grade brain cancer or very early prostate cancer, the rate of shedding is much slower and lower, and it's much harder to detect. But these are the very cancers we need to detect. And our success rate of early liquid biopsy in detection with detection is 80 plus percent, which is amazing. But you need to know what to do with it and, and how to focus on, on what someone's at risk for. So let's focus on risk. Let's talk about the deadliest cancers that we have and let's sort of decode what's standard and what really should be done and what, and what we're doing, what I'm doing in the clinic. So lung cancer is the number one killer. It kills more than all of these other cancers, breast, colon, pancreatic, and prostate combined. And, um, and people say, you know what? It's all smoking related. I'm not a chain smoker, I'm not at risk. I don't care, right? And that used to be the case. That really used to be the case until the 90s and the millennia switched. And what we started noticing is that 5%, 10%, 15%, now, 20 plus percent of lung cancer is not caused by smoking, primarily. It's caused by inhalation, it's caused by pollution. It's, I have a, a young gentleman in his 50s who grew up in the industrial London area, who worked in the oil and gas industry, who uh, had some sort of occupational exposures earlier on in his career, 
and he had a gnarly cancer that we picked up. I'll show you in a bit. Very, very minimal first-hand smoking. Oh, and he grew up in a household with second-hand smoke. So formative years and exposures are super important. And we have, what's our standard of care? So the standard of care is to say, okay, if you be between this age and this age, if you have this much smoking, then I'm going to subject you to scans, to CAT scans, and uh, they will detect a lung cancer. So the problem with that standard of care is that it's so substandard. So like, don't look at this for a second. The, the standard of care misses by its rigor two thirds of, of, of uh, lung cancers. Let me say it again. The technology, if, te if the technology were used appropriately, smartly for people at risk, they would detect two thirds patients more. Right now, two thirds of patients who are at risk are not offered the screening because the screening criteria is so stringent that the person at risk will never qualify by insurance to get it done, even though the technology is available. What happens when that happens? What happens when that happens, so this is a CAT scan, and this is a person I met with lung cancer. You don't need to be a radiologist to see that there is a huge tumor on the left side in the lung. This is what the lung looks like. There is a humongous tumor on the left side of the lung that was causing symptoms of obstruction, of um, spitting up blood. And, uh, and it's a woman who saw me and she was quite advanced and we threw the kitchen sink at her. And her cure rate, if everything goes just perfect, is at best 30%, at best. Now, this is also a lung cancer right there. And this cancer we picked up in the, uh, in the young man from, um, who was born in London and had the occupational exposures and not classic you know, smoking exposure. And he would have never qualified for this, but he was at risk. So the likelihood of curing this lung cancer is over 90%. But you know what? We didn't, we didn't follow the standard of care, which is really substandard, uh, incorporated screening CT into his protocol, and he should be cured now. A drastic difference, a difference in outcome. Okay, let's look. So early detection saves lives. It's just, it's just plain and simple. Let's look at the number two killer, colorectal cancer. So the standard of care is to do what? Starting age what? Age when? Yeah, so that changed last year. It used to be 50. It changed to 45 last year based on population studies that went from 90s to early 2000s. So the, the study actually ended in like 2004. And that what was being shown is that men primarily, but also some women, age 40 to 50, had a 20-fold increase in right-sided lung uh, um, colorectal cancer. 20-fold. But it took another 10 plus years for the guidelines to change. And the screening is at age 45, not 40. Because if we start doing it at 40, it's going to cause too much disruption to be doing that. So what should you do? And you should really be thinking, in addition to colonoscopies, risk stratifying. And that's by looking at stool DNA looking at microbiome and looking at capsule endoscopy. And I'm going to talk about capsule on the next slide. So it's based on the concept that if you have a cancer here, again, it's not just sitting there. It doesn't just sit there and look pretty. It's shedding its DNA and its material, and you're literally pooping it out. You know, you're pooping it out with debris, and we can pick it up with very high accuracy. By high accuracy, I mean like over 90% <laughs> that there is a high-grade tumor-based uh, content in the stool. And when combined with genetic risk and microbiome risk, we can get a very good gauge for what is, what is this person's risk? Is there average risk percent lifetime risk for colon cancer the same way as 15%? You need to be way more vigilant. So a huge part of the assessment is what's called a microbiome. A microbiome is the, is the composition of the gut. The, uh, uh, what bacteria reside in the gut? What percent of uh, immune system resides in the gut? Ed, don't say it. Yeah, about 70%, right? So this is, like, th this is our uh, skin and gut are the biggest barriers. And what we know is that the more diverse your gut flora is, the more rich your microbiome, the healthier your immune system, and the, the better you're able to fight off cancer and other 
uh, autoimmune conditions. So much so that people with metastatic and early stage colorectal cancers, melanomas, are getting fecal implants to actually boost the immune system. And we know that we can treat folks with certain immune therapies to turn the immune system into Superman. And if we actually tickle their gut flora and the immune system into fighting and recognizing the foreign entities, they have drastically different outcomes. What I mean by drastically, they live two, three, four times longer than average. And the thought is, well, can we bring this, can we bring this earlier? And this is based on population studies, looking at different, uh, do, doing, uh, looking at population studies and seeing who has healthier gut floras and what is it predisposing our risk to and how long does it take to change your gut flora. So population risks of Americans and Africans were done and who do you think had a, a richer gut flora? Yeah, Africans, right? A and then their diets were reversed, right? So, so the Americans would fed an African diet and the vice versa. And in three weeks, their gut signature changed. Now, we aren't always able to do this, right? Because I see patients and we check their microbiome and we say, okay, you need to be doing more fiber, you need to do, be doing more whole plants, and, and they can't. I'm like, well, I'm just going to pop a pill. Ain't going to work, right? So you, sometimes you need to heal their gut and so that, you know, it's not leaky and they're able to absorb. But it, it, it's a path and a goal, right? You need to, you need to heal and enrich your, enrich your gut and that will lead to much better health. Let's talk about capsule endoscopy. Uh, we have this technology, uh, should have been, I think it was probably invented by Israelis, but not that I'm biased, that you can swallow this little capsule, it'll uh, go down your esophagus, look, go through your stomach, it can look at bleeding, it can look at early um, gastric cancers, and it'll go into the small bowel and would take really high quality pictures of your small bowel and detect early polyps, lesions, and the like. So I have a patient who had a liquid biopsy done and had a very high signature for colorectal cancer. And I'm running his whole bowel. And part of the running the small bowel uh, of the whole bowel is looking at his small bowel. And it's going to be upper bowel and lower bowel, which is, you know, which we where we usually stop. But you know, the, the, the small bowel neoplasms are notoriously very hard to find because because small bowel is very pliable and it can hold a lot of crap, literally, right? It's distendable. So by the time that people start having issues and obstruction, the tumor is so big, especially in the small bowel, that, oh my God, it's too late, or the lymph node is involved and you need a major vac and chemo. So you can detect with this, you know, available technology, if you're using it smartly and risk stratify people, early polyps just like in the colon. Let's look at pancreatic cancer. Um, it is projected that pancreatic cancer is going to outcompete colorectal cancer, which is currently number two killer within the next two decades. It's going to be number two cause of death. Uh, and not just by a little bit. The, the incidence of pancreatic cancer projected to increase to 150% over the next 10 to 20 years. And what's the current standard of care? There's no standard of care. It's, it, 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 it's, it's mind boggling. What we know is that if we look at higher risk population and we screen them, so what got me thinking about this is that I, you know, I, had, a, I had a young girl who was 23. Uh, when I met her, she, was, she turned 24 and got diagnosed with breast cancer basically as she got, in, uh, as she got married. Um, and she had what's called the leaf from many syndrome. It's, it's, it's a genetic syndrome that puts you at very high risk for, for brain tumors, uh, breast cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And the, uh, the guidelines are suggesting that people who are at higher risk, you should really monitor them and screen them with more imaging because that saves lives. So there's nothing, there's nothing special or particular about leaf from many per se. It is really what is your risk. If your risk is below a certain threshold, you really need to do more than just kind of raise your arms and throw your arms up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm doing the standard of care and, you know, uh, my your general likelihood of having pancreatic cancer is pretty low, so it's not worth checking it. Because you know what happens when that happens? 
meet John. So this is John, whom I met about a year and a half ago, an amazing fellow. He, present, he came in to see me with a pancreatic cancer that was huge. So the, the, this, this hypermetabolic, this, this uh, yellow stuff is his cancer. It basically replaced his upper abdomen, invaded his liver, and there were lung, lung metastasis. He was on his deathbed. He fought valiantly for nine months. We got him better. We hooked him up for, with clinical trials. He got better, and he died like that. And I so wish that I would have met him at least five years ago because then we had a real chance to pick this up early. Or 15 to 20 years prior to that, maybe we could have prevented it, because the way I monitor for this is looking for two main genetic markers, which are huge risk factors for pancreatic cancer, looking, looking at clot-forming markers, because once cancers are starting to proliferate, they, again, they don't just sit there, they start sp spitting out these basically clot forming uh, signatures and doing liquid biopsies. Because this is like, this was, he was the classic person this should have been done. So stage one pancreatic cancer. The likelihood of cure of this cancer is probably about 80%. And in the process of screening for that, we actually found a number of other things for, uh, in him. His liver was, was overladen with, um, with iron. He had hemochromatosis the disease of iron accumulation. He started accumulating just a tad in his heart. He had a cardiovascular disaster. He was ready to, th to throw some uh, plaque for heart attacks. Common denominators. Started him on, on phlebotomy programs, de decreased his uh, iron overload, started screening for this. He is alive and doing better today than he was a year and a half ago. Amazing. Is it, is it standard of care? Absolutely not. Is it, did it make, you betcha, prostate cancer. How good is standard of care and how good is current monitoring? So current monitoring is, um, you know, to screen someone maybe with a PSA, which is a prostate-specific antigen, if your family practice physician is feeling up to it that particular day and maybe stick a, you know, finger up your rear end and feel your prostate if they feel comfortable with it. Or if you request it, which, you know, kind of puts them like, it's weird to request the test. So, so the current technology and standard of care are really crappy. You know, PSA can miss upwards of 40% of prostate cancer. And when there is a suggestion of prostate cancer and we do a biopsy, which is, you know, portrayed here, this is a cross section of a prostate, this is a needle that's going into the prostate this needle will miss the prostate cancer altogether. Thankfully, now urologists are doing 12 core biopsies. So let's say they get it, but they get this part. So you see that this is pink and this is red, yeah? So this is lower grade prostate cancer, this is higher grade prostate cancer. And what's gonna determine the outcome of this prostate cancer is not gonna be the pink, it's gonna be the red. That's the clinically more aggressive and meaningful behavior. So you need to biopsy this and not that. So a biopsy can miss 25 to 30%. Often it is like looking for a needle in a haystack. What can we do? Urine biopsy, right? So that prostate cancer, it's not just sitting there, it's excreting again, it's tumor cells and DNA. And not just that, this bladder cancer is doing the same thing and, uh, and uh, kidney cancer is doing the same thing. I had the, so, so with over 90% accuracy, we can detect, you know, with a simple urine test, folks who are at higher risk. And, and not when your PSA is over a threshold of normal, it's actually when it's in the mid-range of normal. So let me say it again, your PSA could range here. And if it's here, we say, oh, this is a problem, we need to do something to you. But you know that, we know that in this range, you've got a 40% likelihood of having it and missing it. So if we check this test here, you have about a 95% accuracy of saying yay and prostate cancer and with how aggressive it is. Do you need a biopsy? Do you need more, um, more um, attention? Because you, you can do really specialized things to find that more aggressive prostate cancer if you know where to look. 
Speaking of where to look, I, I had the dubious uh, privilege and honor of becoming the primary care physician for my mother-in-law. It wasn't exactly by choice, but it just so happened, you know, and then I couldn't say no anymore. And, but maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it was a good thing because she had really funny symptoms. She had really funny symptoms and she just wasn't doing well. And I was, I started developing my program and I ran the, the, the blood work on her and I really didn't like it. And I started getting really agitated with my sort of Russian euphemisms, uh, euphemisms that shouldn't be uttered here, and said, you know, like, you can't look at these numbers. Why didn't you tell me that you're having these numbers? This is, something's, something's going on and we need to check it out. I'm like, like, leave me alone. Yeah, I had this blood work with my primary care done, you know, a year ago and everything was fine. I'm like, no, 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 no. You did not have this blood work done a year ago. You had a drastically different standard of care blood work done a year ago something's going on, we need to image you and see what's happening. And she's like, absolutely not, I'm doing one test. Leave me alone. And, and, and so but I'm like, okay, let, let's, so I did an ultrasound thinking that maybe she's got like an upper GI something, or maybe it's a kidney something. We did an ultrasound and it's fine. You know, it looks okay, no problem. I'm like, you know what, this is just not right. You, you've got something going on, your symptoms don't make sense, and your numbers don't make sense. So I ordered an MRI. Um, of your abdomen because just statistically and, and looking at her risks, she had either an upper GI cancer, I thought, or a kidney cancer. And lo and behold, there it was. She had a three and a half centimeter kidney cancer. That was completely missed on an ultrasound and insurance. So, and then what happened is that the, 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 the hospital did the MRI, but they didn't actually get a pre-auth and then they got a denial and saying this MRI was not indicated because it wasn't truly really falling within standard of care, so you, we're, really not gonna f we're really not gonna cover it. But at that point, we already had tissue diagnosis of kidney cancer. I'm like, hello, this was completely missed by standard of care, labs, imaging, and if it wasn't for you know, the, 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 the risk stratification and the non sterile blood work, we would have missed it. So she had you know, partial kidney resection and the likelihood of cure is 98%. If we picked it up symptomatically, she would have been, she would have at least had her whole kidney out with lymph nodes, potentially chemotherapy and higher in, in, in likelihood of recurrence that was at least 40% higher. And now, you know what? She says, what else do you want me to do now? <laughs> so I scored. Let's talk about breast cancer, the most common cancer in women. How good is a mammogram to detect breast cancer. So let's let's look at a woman who is uh, 40 to 50 and a 2D mammogram. How good is it? It's about 30%, okay? So there is a breast cancer right there, which is hard to see because this woman has dense breasts because she's young and young women have dense breasts because th there is proliferation in the breast tissue and they have breast tissue that's uh, having lots of support structure and more sturdiness, and that's by definition the case. Um, so we try to improve this imaging by doing three-dimensional mammography, which is showing this lesion better. It's right there. But in fact, it's actually looking more like this. This is a breast MRI. This tumor is huge. There is a different type of breast cancer around it, and there are lymph nodes around. So there is a total sense of false security when you go to standard of care for monitoring, because I can't tell you how many like gynecologists I talk to and they say, okay, you're 40, we're gonna send you for a mammogram. And the question is, okay, well, what is my risk of breast cancer? Because if my risk of breast cancer is this, like, so, so the way, like, we know the most about breast cancer of all cancers, as far as screening, as far as risk factors, as far as how to monitor it, because women are so awesome and, like, and, and they've done studies and reported outcomes. And we know that when someone is here, uh, you know, they're below average risk or around average risk, which is about 12% lifetime, you can probably get away with a mammogram, but not this mammogram. Like never do a two-dimensional mammogram. That's, that technology is over 100 years old. And I bet you no one is using a cell phone that's over, well, they weren't possible. I actually, my daughter was, uh, was saying, I, I think... I need to talk to my um, to my friends now, you know, and uh, and I think I need a phone. Like, um, okay, I guess we'll get you a house phone. You know, you can have a house phone and you can call 
house phone. Yeah, you know, one of those things that you use a dial and you, she's like, what is that? Yeah, so even that technology is less than 100 years old, right? But, but we, we're using for screening, we're using technology that's 120 years old uh, and thinking that it's okay. But, you know, a Tesla is, you know, you're driving a Tesla and getting your 2D mammogram blows my mind. So at the very least, you know, an average risk woman should get a 3D mammogram just because it's, you know, the likelihood that there's going to be a problem is going to be relatively low. But if you're high risk or high intermediate risk, insurance will actually pay for this. You might need to do some massaging, this and that, but they'll actually cover this because, again, there is nothing magical about um, certain genes. It's really what is your risk and how to assess it. And I can't tell you, like, so in the last year, I, I saw two women in their 40s who came in and uh, saw me with lumps that they felt within six months of a normal mammogram. And they said, Doc, like, how is it possible? Like, here it is. Here's the lump. But I had a completely normal mammogram six months ago. Like, did it develop in the last six months? Of course it didn't. It just, if it's a crappy test and you don't know how to appropriately risk stratify someone, you're going to miss it. Um, common denominator, right? So let's talk about cardiovascular disease because, again, the recurrent theme that I was seeing is that if you don't succumb to that breast cancer and you're at risk for it, you're for sure at risk for cardiovascular disease. And if you address one, you for sure address the other. So this is a cross-section through a coronary artery, and we're looking on the inside. So this is how we come out of the manufacturer. You know, one cell layer thick, nice and thin, and then life starts happening to us. Western lifestyle, we start accumulating plaque, then we start forming a fortress around that plaque called calcium, and that's growing, 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 and then we finally get someone on a treadmill and say, you know, like if I really stress you, are you okay? So what we're really looking for is a stable plaque and a potential heart attack. The, uh, and the problem with the strategy of standard of care is from here to there, it could be six hours to a heart attack. From here to there is 30 plus years. Now you can walk backwards and you, you have discrete steps like, you know, one mutation, two mutations, three mutations in the vet. You can certainly arrest or walk backwards, but it's so much easier to say, I'm going to detect early and walk backwards early as opposed to I'm going to wait for an adverse outcome like a heart attack and then start walking backwards. What does it lo actually look like in clinic? That's what it looks like. Uh, so this is, uh, this, is, this is a couple that I saw, a husband and a wife, husband and a wife. This is a cross-section of a heart. This is a coronary artery that's coming out. Nice and healthy. You can see that it's looking the same as the um, adjacent structures. This is what coronary plaque looks like. This is coronary calcium. This gentleman had a calcium score of over 1,000, completely asymptomatic, totally not standard of care. We stressed him, he was doing fine, except he went into ventricular tachycardia, but he didn't feel it for a little bit. So we got him to a cardiologist, he got a stent, had a critical lesion, and he was a walking time bomb. He would have collapsed from his VT, or ventricular fib fibrillation, probably within two years. Probably saved his life. Totally departed from standard of care. Totally said, what are you at risk for? You're at risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer. But you know what? I I'm just an oncologist. Cardiovascular disease, not my problem. Can do that. Can do that. So, so, so the problem with the coronary calcium is that it's not a very dynamic measurement of change, meaning if someone has hard plaque like this, it's not going to magically go away in a year. You need more time. Um, you can look at someone's carotid health and you can gauge much more dynamically how well they're doing cardiovascularly. Uh, and also that will be a good uh, marker for a uh, decrease in, in um, cal uh, cancer risk. So let's look at, at that picture. So this is, we're measuring the thickness of this wall and all of this is plaque. It's 1.8 millimeters, and it should be less than 0.7 millimeters. And what you have here is nice-looking plaque. 
but sitting there and waiting to cause a stroke. Completely asymptomatic. Not on an aspirin, uh, not really on the statin, eating what he likes to eat, but, you know, saying that I'm scared about pancreatic cancer. He should be scared of pancreatic cancer, but right now what he's got sitting in him is plaque. That's going to, you know, probably get him first before pancreatic cancer does. A year later, that's what he looks like. His plaque burden drastically reduced. The thickness of plaque went down by 30%. His pancreatic cancer risk probably went down by 30% as well. But I can't measure it, you know? But we got his attention. Totally not standard of care and totally helping him. So again, what should you do? Like, if you're health conscious and if you want to be more proactive, should you, know, should you fall for just what standardized testing is? Or do you really focus on what's available, what's customizable, what really makes sense and how you can re stratify your features and your factors and address it properly? Doesn't it make more sense rather than saying, well, I am going to follow guidelines that basically put me at huge risk for being, you know, a statistic, and if you're a man, one in, five, one in two, right? Am I, which 50% am I in? If I'm a woman, I am one in three. Or I have strokes, or I have autoimmune disease. Why isn't this happening already? Why isn't my primary care doing this? And why is that standard practice? Three reasons. Insurance is a huge reason, and insurance is not our friend. I love it. Um, and what they do is they use three modalities. They use um, AI, artificial intelligence, to say if you, when you order tests, if you don't meet this, this, and this criteria, you automatically get a denial. Let's say you go through that and you don't, then a nurse reviews the case and has additional veto power. And then you get a you know, second line of denial. And then you have a physician who says, well, it doesn't meet criteria, guidelines, I'm going to deny it. Insurance is not your friend. Its purpose and design is to save money. And if an intervention makes sense for them financially, it'll be approved. But then time, right? An average primary care used to spend, what, about 11 minutes per patient visit? I think now it's more like eight uh, not possible to address. It's just a mill, 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 mill. It's, it's a numbers game. And really lack of expertise, because what I'm talking to you about is, is just so much more in-depth than, than, than an average primary care can really address. It's, it's, it's much more molecularly savvy, and you don't really know who to screen. So who, who should you screen? The appropriate question is, who shouldn't you screen? Because, you know, the, the studies really suggest that two-thirds of Americans don't know their risk. Uh, they think that if I don't chain smoke and I don't bake myself under, you know, the Colorado sun, I'm fine, which is so not true. So really, if you have more than, you know, two or more of these risk factors, you should get screened. Personal history, age, ever smoker, diabetic sy uh, metabolic syndrome, and I can't emphasize this enough, if you drink more than five alcoholic drinks per week, you're about double your risk of cancer here. So it's not like, oh, I don't have a problem with this, or I just do it for fun socially. You know, it, it, it's really what you're exposed to time after time. And it's not, um, and it's not just, oh, but I, I, I do this intermittently and only on weekends. Um, food is a huge component. And not f food as medicine as far as not supplements, but... Um, as far as risk reduction in specific population with specific components. So plant-based whole food diet um, has been studied in colorectal survivors, in uh, pancreatic uh, cancer patients, in addition to nuts, tree nuts. And what's been shown is that if survivors of colorectal cancer have a handful of tree nuts post their diagnosis, they reduce recurrence by about 40%, which is pretty much equivalent, if not better, to chemotherapy. You know, if you have, if you have about 30 grams of whole food fiber, then you decrease your risk of colorectal cancer by about 30% and upper GI cancer by about 20%. If you take 30 grams of fiber in the form of Metamucil, what's your risk reduction? Zero. So playing God, albeit attractive, 
doesn't replace God. You know, we have all of these things, just eat them. Eat whole food, please, you know? Eat whole food, eat nuts, eat things that are more stationary as opposed to more moving. Better for you. We've talked about food, we're going to talk about water. What is this? Yeah, it's a water filter. It's a water filter from our house. So last summer, the sprinkler system stopped working. There was no pressure. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. The grass started dying. I'm like, what is going on? And my lovely wife did some research and she said, you know what, I, um, you know, Colorado is kind of a dirty place and, uh, and we, need to, um, we need to install a filter for the main water intake. Uh, so, it, and I didn't read, you know, um, mail, you know, uh, I don't read instructions. Uh, like I put it in and I'm like, okay, good. So it was, it's supposed to be changed every six months. So this was eight months later. Okay. So this is an eight months old filter. This is a new filter. So there was, there was so much garbage in the main that there was no water pressure. Changed this, started working. I didn't think we lived in the slums of Denver, but apparently we do. So we are what we, we, are what we drink, drink, we are what we eat, we are what we breathe. Please be mindful of that. So this is the last slide, and I, I just want to give you a visual representation of that, of how this plays out internationally. And this helped me to frame this. Are we really number one in health? Are we really number one in disease? So these are the rates of breast cancer and prostate cancer in the world. We are here. We're pretty much the top of the pyramid as far as the incidence of cancer, both for breast cancer, prostate cancer, but you can easily replace this with colorectal cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, melanoma. Uh, like we are, Colorado is the second place in the world for melanoma outside of Australia and New Zealand. Uh, that's obviously because in the rest of the world, there is no sun, you know, obviously. And incidentally, just saying, New Zealand is the dairy capital of the world. Just a coincidence. So, uh, the, the slide is brought to you by, f uh, by meat and dairy industry. Um, so, the rates of, of uh, breast cancer are 300% higher here than they're in Asia. And they're nearly 1,000% higher here than in Asia. And when you take this population within one to two generations and you plop them here, they are here. That's obviously because their genes have mutated, right? No, yes. no, no. So that's what happens to us. And it's just really not popular. And, and it's become so pervasive. It's like when I take my kids to a pediatrician and you look at the back flip of the, of the magazine, what do you see? Skittles, M&Ms, you know, uh, chocolate milk. And then you come in and you see, well, you need to eat healthy. I mean, but what is, what's the messaging? And, and there is another huge component, which, which I, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't emphasize it because it's so important. It's not like, you know, it's not self-flagellation, what I'm showing you here, because there is a concerning statistic currently in the U.S., and the hit, you know, sort of the, the blip in mortality really happened last year. And what was noticed is that, you know, we've had a steady increase in life expectancy for men and women over the last two decades, you know, except for last year. Men started reversing. And particularly, not just any man, but it's middle-aged, well-to-do white men started dying at a higher rate, mostly due to suicide, depression, um, addiction, loneliness disconnectedness, uh, as opposed to the highest concentrations of octogenarians plus, which is in the Corsica Basin. When those populations were studied, it wasn't that they were eating the most organic pasta or had the sort of the, the secret primavera so source, uh, source, right? They were connected. They had social networks. They, were, they had intimacy. They were, they were engaging in normal human interactions. We live in such a technologically rich age that we've never been more depressed, obese, drunk, addicted, and disconnected. And I bet you that this is partially why this is. It's not just that I drink. Um, he gets 
basically abused by his financial industry on a daily basis, and then they pay for whatever. Like so, so he has this amazing healthcare cover that covers whatever, and uh, so we'll destroy your body, and then we'll pay you to fix your health afterwards, which makes a lot of sense. And, and then when you come back, you know, you, you come home and like I'm so stressed, I need to relax. You know, I need to relax. Um, how do I relax? Well, I, you know, I work out really hard, and I have a and I have a cocktail. I don't really talk to my wife. I play with my kids, but I play with my kids as a, as a dad, not as like, I am struggling with this right now, like how can I connect with you? Or I don't call up my friend because I'm too tired, it takes too much energy. So incorporating those elements into our, wealth, uh, into our wellness, into our health, is actually decreasing the likelihood of that. Because it's, it's for sure going to play out. We can't, we can't just, you know, you can't just say, I'm going to have a glass of water and I'll be okay. You, you, you'll, you'll need to vent somehow. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs>